A hey, uh, very good presentation, Brent. Thanks very much. It's good to see passion in uh, something that's so important. So that was really, really good. As Bill said, my name is Mike Bennis, and I'm with a battery company called Brentronics. Um, first, I want to thank AUSA for making this forum possible. This is a great opportunity to, to introduce some new technology that you don't normally see w walking around the floor. And I'd like to thank Bill Garland in particular for putting this together and putting such a professional team and, 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 an, and an organization together right here. Uh, seems like we all have the same problem getting this thing started. Uh, okay. <laughs> so it wasn't me, right? There we go. That's good. Okay. All right. Brentronics has been around for about 40 some years. So we are not a new organization. We were founded in about 1973 by a gentleman by the name of Leo Brenner. Truly American success story. Leo started the company in his garage with a $5,000 investment, and the first battery was this lipstick battery that we sold to Seacom. Today, we're over a $50 million company, and Seacom and the Army is still our biggest customer. Uh, we were the first to introduce for the, for the military lithium ion rechargeable batteries. Uh, we were first to put state of charge indicators on, on batteries. We were the first to do smart chargers. We were the first to do solar and wind charging so the warfighter could charge his batteries wh wherever they might be as long as there was wind and as long as there was sun. And then we were also the first to do the in industry standard soldier modernization program. And we've done that now probably four or five times throughout the world with the, uh, with the Army's blessing. Uh, we also introduced SM Buzz protocol on our batteries, and I'll, and I'll get into that in a little bit. We're the largest supplier today of military rechargeable batteries. Uh, we have the ISO 9001 certification that's necessary for most of mil military manufacturing. We have a dedicated engineering team located up in Comac, New York, and, and that's where our headquarters are. We have a 70,000 square feet up there with about 300 employees that are that are making these batteries. So every everything you'll see today and everything we talk about is made in the United States. It's designed, developed, and manufactured up up in up in Comac. Uh, we have 40 plus engineers on staff. We, we have the ability to do rapid prototyping. We can do all our testing in house. Uh, we are complete power and power and energy systems. So we got batteries. We got chargers. We got power systems. We we can do. Uh, uh, and uh, custom products. This is what I call our family portrait. We have over 60 different batteries in our portfolio today. Most of the most of the batteries are soldier portable technology. Uh, the, uh, we also have about 30 different chargers that we have available. Everything from uh, uh, vehicle mounted chargers that, that you see there on the side to soldier portable chargers that are like briefcase chargers that can charge up to eight batteries for the one on the right. And the one on the left is a soldier portable charger light and it does two batteries at a time. We also have the ability to use cigarette lighters to charge batteries. So like I said, we have 30 different versions, all very, very flexible. Um, I think I skipped one, but that's okay. We'll just jump right in. The first time a military vehicle was used in a military operation was a punitive expedition in 1916. Pancho Villa had come across the border in Columbus, New Mexico, killed several people, and basically caused, uh, ca caused a lot of havoc. Needless to say, the wall that we keep hearing about on the news and with the election would have, would have helped those people quite a bit. Uh, so Brigadier General John Persing put together a large force of troops, horses, and for the first time ever, trucks to go after Pancho Villa. The truck they used was a 1915 GMC Model 15 three-quarter ton truck pictured here. Although they didn't catch Pancho Villa in this expedition, they did learn an awful lot about vehicles in the fight so that when they did, they were reintroduced into World War II in 1917, we, we were much more aware of what, what the problems and what the situation would be. Now the lead acid battery and the lead acid technology that was used in 1915 is identical to the lead acid technology that we're, that we're using today. That, that technology was, was invented in 1859. It was primarily used at that time for starting lights and ignition, and that's all we needed it for. So for the past, for the first 
100 years of its life, it served its purpose really well. Even though it has a low energy to weight to volume ratio, a lead acid battery is still very, very effective, and I'm sure we all have them in our cars today. The battery pictured here is a Hawker battery, probably the most popular battery in the military vehicle force today for sure. It's a 12 volt battery that has about 1.5 kilowatt hour worth of energy, and it's in virtually every vehicle the, the military uses. And as a matter of fact, most ve military vehicles, and there is a fleet of about 500,000 of them, use two of those batteries in conjunction with one another to give you 24 volt uh, capability. Now, those batteries were fine early on in the, in, the, uh, in, in, in the war fighting game, so to speak. But today, when you have sensors, you have jammers, you have communication technology, you have control systems, and today we're starting to put some active protection systems on our vehicles, lead acid batteries just don't, don't cut the gray. There's two different exhibits out here on the floor. One is a uh, Bradley fighting vehicle, that's upstairs. They've got eight lead acid batteries in those vehicles. That's about uh, 700 pounds worth of batteries. The, uh, there's another containerized weapons, weapons, weapons systems outside that has six lead acid batteries in there. That weighs about 528 pounds. This particular battery that Brentronics brought is a lithium ion 24 volt battery and it weighs 42 pounds. Stuck again. Yeah. I can continue a little bit, though. Yeah. No, no. There we go. That'll, that'll work. OK, today, Brentronics has a uh, three different versions of a 24-volt lithium-ion battery, a 6T battery. The 6T is a nomenclature that the Army uses to identify the particular battery. It's basically the size and the shape. So we have a basically what we've made today is a drop-in battery replacement for the existing technology. There's no need to, to redesign the battery compartment. You're not going to need nearly as many, but you certainly still have the same ability to just drop it in and play. Uh, I'm not going to read all of these to you, but they're certainly certainly uh, vi visible, the features and the benefits of the, of the battery. It's a 24-volt lithium-ion battery as opposed to the 12 volts, so it's much more flexible. It's got a standard 60 dimension, so you can drop it into the existing battery compartments that you already have. It's a lightweight battery, 42 pounds versus 88 pounds. But as I said before, all vehicles have at least two of those in there, so that's 188 pounds. And we're only going to use one of these, so that's a, that's a savings of about 134 pounds. Uh, Colonel, Colonel William Bailey yesterday from, from Tradac talked about the, the ability and the desire to start saving weight on, these, on, on all our platforms. And I venture to guess there's not another technology that you can save virtually hundreds of pounds by going into a newer technology that's going to give you a longer life and uh, the other features to run some of the different technology. A lead acid battery lasts about a year today in a military vehicle. This battery has a lifetime of about 10, 10 years, so the life is going to be uh, significantly longer. The logistic change at chain is going to be significantly reduced. We've got a sophisticated battery management system. I'm sure we've all heard about the, the challenges that a uh, lithium ion battery makes today, especially when you start putting them in planes. But we have a sophisticated battery management system in here that protects against anything that could probably happen to the battery, such as overcharge, undercharge, overcurrent, discharge control, all kinds of things like that to make it extremely safe. It also has a wide operating temperature, minus 40 C to uh, plus 60 C, and that's about minus 40 Fahrenheit up to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. If we're going to operate in temperatures that's colder than that, we have the ability to put coils inside this platform into this battery. So it's not going to, doesn't, you don't need it to run the battery, but you might need it to start the battery. And those, those coils will keep the battery warm enough, minus 40, to, to be able to start the vehicle when, when you're ready to start. We also have an SM bus capability in this vehicle, in this battery. And basically what that gives you, as we talked about, it's a CAN bus communication capability. Once again, I won't read the whole thing to you, but it gives you a state of charge, something you can't do with a lead acid battery. It also gives you the remaining capacity that's in a battery. It'll tell you the full charge capacity. It'll tell you the temperature of the battery, and, it, and it'll tell you the cycle count. So if you're about to go out on a mission, you can find out, hey, this battery is working pretty well. It's only uh, a year and a half old. You can find that information out from a control panel. You can find it out from a computer hooked up to the batteries, or you can find it out from a, from a, from a command center or, or, or a commo center. 
The battery I mentioned is going to last about 10 times as long. Let's just take a look at what happens if you have 100% dip to discharge. We know we'd never do that with a lead acid battery. If you, if you were to do that once to a lead acid battery, the battery is pretty much dead. In this particular case, we've, we've pulled all the energy out of the battery over a, uh, uh, and after 1,680 cycles, that's about four and a half years, this battery is still operating 80% at capacity. So that's a lithium ion capability at a full 100% depth of discharge. Now let's take that one step farther and, and just treat the battery a little bit better and only take out 90% of it. So once again, if you did that for a lead acid battery, it wouldn't last any longer than a couple of days. But for a lithium ion battery going down 90% depth of discharge, it's going to last eight and a half years, about 32,000 cycles. Now, to, to compare that to a lead acid today, the specs that the Army has put out ask for a lead acid battery to be, uh, bring it down depth of discharge only 40%. 40%, that's hardly anything, but then it's only going to last about a year, 360 days. So if you take it down 60%, if you take it down 80%, it's going to wear itself out. I don't know if any of you have ever seen those pictures of the uh, uh, battery graveyard in Iraq, uh, or, uh, and it shows thousands and thousands of batteries that basically have been depleted. And, you know, half of those batteries might be okay, but without the communication capability that, that we do now have in the technology, lithium ion, you'll never know that to be true. So this is a, uh, can, can be a real game changer. Last slide I'll show you, I talked about energy density, and this is just a, a bar chart that gives you a pretty good idea. A uh, lithium ion has about 142 watt hours per kilogram, and the same battery in the lead acid side has about 30 eight kilograms. Where we are today, we've got, uh, needless to say, we've got some batteries up at Tardec going through some testing. We're working with Tardec as well as the other vendors in the, in, in the business uh, to write some new specs uh, for a lithium ion battery. Uh, we also have some batteries out, out at the Nevada Automotive Test Center, which is out, outside of Reno, and they've got them in two different marine demonstrators. And they've been up there for about three and a half months now. They're not using them to start the vehicles. They're, they're using super caps to start vehicles, but they are using those to run the electronics. And it's, uh, it's working perfectly, shock vibe, all, all the other technologies that, that the military requires. So we've been very successful. And we're about to go into 9310 testing with the Navy down in Carter Rock. Let me leave you with, with one little uh, statement. I was reading the uh, latest version of AUSA News, uh, and General Miley, the Army Chief of Staff, was at a, at a breakfast, and he talked about readiness, the need to modernize, which is a top, top priority. Senator John McCain, the uh, uh, Senate Armed Service Committee Chairman, talked about the Army must modernize for the harsh, harsh realities of the 21st century. I think we've heard that here a couple of times in, in the last couple of days as well. The Army is woefully behind on, on modernization, McCain went on to say, essentially organized and equipped as if it was, as if it was 1980. Well, the battery technology we're using is as if it was 1880. So the technology is here, the technology is available, the technology is ready, and uh, I'll leave it at that, and I'll open it up for any questions. Mike, first let me just say that it was a great presentation, and I'm glad I finally got you up on the stage here, because no one can do a a better job of, of, of pitching or of, of demonstrating your capability. Thanks, Thank Bill. You. I appreciate that. Um, so the question is, all right, so when is this going to happen? When will units be able to start ordering, whether it's your battery, but basically the technology to replace the 50-year-old, the 60-year-old technology? Good question. Thanks very much, Bill. I think we all know the military game. We're all in here trying to make the same thing happen with some very exciting technology. Doesn't happen overnight. We've got to go to TRADOC to get the requirement, which we already heard about that for a little bit from Jeff Williams today. But we also get, have to convince the, uh, the users that there's a new technology out there. As I said, we're up at TARDEC right now. I'm talking to all the integrators. We're talking to all the, all the military. The commercial environment has already accepted this, has already embraced this, and I'm selling this into the, military, in, into the, into the commercial environment. So we've already got products going out the door. Uh, we all know that the military is a little slower to react. They love to see, they love the fact that we're selling it into the commercial environment. It only means there's going to be more and more users as we get down the line. But uh, 
It's an exciting technology, and, and, it, and it truly is a game changer, especially when you start talking about all the technology and all the electronics that are we now run on these vehicles. And the significant weight savings alone can make a major difference. I, we've all heard about programs being canceled because they're a pound or two overweight. Well, in, a, in, in this particular environment, we can drop hundreds of pounds in, a, in, a, in, in the energy environment.